Hello, <clears throat> welcome back everybody. Okay, today's video is going to be dedicated to the Pentax K1. So this is a camera that I basically learned photography on, to be honest. Um, I knew a bit about photography before I owned the K1, but it's the first camera I really sunk my teeth into and decided to really understand inside and out. And in doing so, um, learned a great deal about photography and the limitations of this camera. Now, it's an interesting thing since owning the, I've been meaning to do this, this, this video for a while, basically, ever since I bought this X-T4, which I'm filming on right now, this Fuji. It's uh, after about six months of using the Fuji and really getting to understand how that camera works. It's a really interesting experience because it teaches you all the things that you took for granted with your older cameras. Um, it can be, you know, buying something new, um, especially if it's a more recent camera with all the, the bells and whistles. It can be quite a, an interesting experience because on the one hand, you, you do go, oh, I really appreciate this feature and that, and it's, it's so much better that it does it like this now. And But it's a double-edged sword, and, and it can be conversely the opposite is true. And you can you can start to go, hmm, I really thought this new recent thing I bought, you know, would do this like my old one does, and it doesn't, and it's not as good, and, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of interesting because I think buying something new or even buying something different can make you appreciate what you had. And at the time when you had it, you took it for granted. You didn't realize it was actually doing quite as good a job as it was. So that's kind of what this video is going to be about today. It's going to be all about uh, the Pentax K1, but not maybe just the K1. Um, having owned the KP and some other cameras from Pentax, I think a lot of this might be transferable to some other bodies as well. So keep watching if you are somebody who is shooting Pentax full stop, um, digital bodies that is. So um, yeah, so that's what this is going to be today. It's not a review, um, just maybe a handful of things that I've really come to appreciate with this camera. And maybe we are going to do some things like menu diving and show some samples and some examples. And hopefully, you know, if you've just got this camera, you'll find this stuff, inf you know, useful. Um, but by no means do you have to, you know, do these things. This is just, you know, my own, you know, how I shoot with it. Everybody shoots differently and has different needs. But um, hopefully, uh, you know, if you don't know what you don't know, Maybe this is one of those videos that helps and, you, and you'll realize, oh, I didn't realize my camera actually could do this or that. And, and, and it helps and makes it a more flexible camera you know, for you to use and uh, helps you get the shots you want. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll get straight into it. Um, we'll start with point number one. I'm doing this, uh, I'm in a different t-shirt, so I, I didn't have a chance to finish the recording the other day, so this is a different day. So if I'm a little bit more stubbly and uh, receding a little bit more, yeah, it's a few days later that I'm getting around to finishing this video, okay, or even starting it. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is a bit of a strange one, actually. Um, I want to talk about the aperture priority mode of the, the K1, or even just Pentax, because I think this is... Uh, this is universal for some of the old other models as well. Bit of a strange one to talk about because you'd be thinking, how's this unique to Pentax? Like lots of cameras do aperture priority mode. In fact, they all do. And that's absolutely true. Just with my experience with um, getting that Fuji X-T4 and having a chat with some other people and other brands, it does appear to me that maybe Pentax have implemented the, the feature um, in a way that I really appreciate and I think it's actually better than a lot of other manufacturers have managed. Certainly I find it um, better than on Fuji and I'll just try and explain what I mean by this. So right now we're looking at, um, and yeah, I do apologize that what we're looking at the scene is very boring. In order for me to use this uh, microphone, camera, tethered cable to a computer, I'm stuck with where I can sort of demonstrate some of this stuff. I'm not, not out in the wild, unfortunately, for this. So <laughs> you'll have to make do with uh, my dining table and my boring kitchen but it'll, it'll illustrate the point i'm sure so right now you can see that i'm at iso auto 800 i'm in aperture prior mode you can see that top left av and it's giving me a f1.9 i'm getting a 125 shutter speed okay that's fine what i often find is when i'm out and about shooting is I know the lens I've got and the fact I've got in-camera stabilization, I could afford to drop below 125 right now and get a cleaner image. And Pentax make it really easy for me to do this. On other cameras, it feels as though, especially the Fuji, it's something I have to take the camera away from my, my eye, the eyepiece uh, away from my eye, and start fiddling around with dials and bring it back again. It's a bit annoying. Pentax is quite nice. I'll just show you briefly. Um, here, there is a dial here, uh, the front dial here. I've been able to bind this feature um, to actually just toggle me 
out of auto ISO and into, into um, directly control the ISO. So I'll just do that just now. So you can see now as I um, push the front dial, I'm just toggled from out of four, 800 auto ISO. Now it's fixed at 400 or fixed at 200. And you can see that shutter speed drop accordingly. And I know, for example, I've got a 43 mil lens on right now. I can safely take this shot at 1 20th without motion shake or anything like that. So that's maybe what I'll do or even ISO 240. But the point is I can just quickly override it by just change it, by just changing that shutter speed. And just instead of having um, aperture priority mode control two variables, which is the, the ISO and the shutter speed, I can say, I'll just control the ISO right now and aperture. So I'm in, charge, in, in charge, I'm in control of two out of the three exposure parameters there. And um, I find it really wonderful. And the nice thing about it is once I've finished, I just push this green button on the back of the camera and it pushes me back into auto ISO. So it's a really good, really good feature. Um, and it, I'm, the reason I'm pointing this out to some owners is I'm not sure out of the box it's set up like this. I don't think it is. In order to get your aperture priority mode working like this, I'm just gonna show you briefly how to do that. We go to menu and then we scroll along to item five, menu five, down to button customization. And in button customization, we go down to eDial programming. And you'll see over here under AV um, parameters, the front dial is working for ISO, the rear dial is aperture, and the green button will toggle me to have an ISO auto on off. And you can see there, there's a lot of different, this is all the things I could do in aperture pride and mode and set my camera up. So there's, you're not stuck with just this way, but I, I can't remember on default, it could be that one on default there where it's just apertures and rear, rear dial. Um, but if you select this one, this is my pretty much my go-to, that's how I get around this. And I just find it a really good way just to control the ISO and get some clean images even whilst I'm, I'm in aperture priority mode. And that's really all there is to say about that, this mode. I just think it's really, really useful. So a couple other little hints here as well. If I press the info button on the back of the camera, then we get this kind of shortcut system for Pentax and lots of other cameras have shortcut menus, Fuji as well. So this is not anything really new. You can see I've got some things I haven't set up here. This one's pretty good. This one here just allows me to just um, roll the rear shutter dial and just control the upper limit of that um, auto ISO. And that's another good way to control ISO as you're, as you're shooting. If you know that you just don't need it to be as high as 3200. Or if, um, 3200 is often my limit, but if I'm working very low light, I might just up it to 6400 temporarily. And that's another good shortcut there as well. There's more though, if you press the OK button here, you also get taken down to this area where you can also adjust the minimum as well. As a, as a maximum, but there's more. This thing here, not a lot of people understand how this works, but this is this is how it's kind of affecting when the ISO auto starts to kick in and what at what shutter speed. And I'll explain it at the moment. If we leave it as standard in the middle and go back to the camera, we can see it's giving me a one one sixtieth of a second. Okay, ISO four hundred. If you go back in again, and now we're going to change it to slow. Now it's giving me. 130th okay instead of 160th so now it's given me even cleaner ISO that we've dropped from 400 down to 200 and it's given me 130th so it's basically saying if you don't think you need much shutter speeds go into slow for your for your aperture priority mode okay we'll go back in again and we'll change it to fast now and we'll see what it says and now it's given me 125 okay so it's, it's a really nice way I mean the other cameras like the Fuji's do it do it really well they have a, you can set a minimum shutter speed that your, your camera will never drop to. And that's quite useful. This is just Pentax's way of getting around it. I think on the KP, you could also have this in conjunction with a minimum shutter speed as well. So the KP and the K3 are probably a little bit more advanced in that respect as well. But that's just a useful little way to sort of control the aperture priority mode. But I certainly just really like this way of just opting out with the, the front dial on the camera there, change the, uh, change the shutter speed um, directly, and then just being able to push that green button and just toggle right back into auto ISO. It's fantastic, it works really well, and I appreciate that. So that's hint number one. <laughs>
this is quite a dull shot and that's because you know what I'm facing right now I've got a lot of specular highlights that I don't mind actually blowing so you know instead of just shooting away and see what you get it's quite nice before I jump into a session I'll quite often start off in live view just have a look at how things are looking if it's too dull and I don't mind you know increasing that um, exposure and blowing a couple of highlights then I'll just just bump it up a little bit. I get a, I get a better idea of what I'm kind of blowing, what highlights and whether they're important highlights just by getting that kind of exposure. It's almost like I'm trying to borrow a little bit of the mirrorless advantage that those cameras have and use them in this DSLR experience still. But at the same time, I'm not going to remain shooting like this for the rest of the session. Once I once I think I've got things looking, you know, exactly the way I want, then I'll just toggle out of live view, back into the OVF mood mode and just start shooting. Um it's just it's just a very useful way to to kind of work out what is right and what is not right. Otherwise, if you you know, if you stay in this OVF mode like like right now too often, then you end up going, you know, you take a shot and you're chimping it and you're going, ah, it's still too dark. And so you raise it a little bit and then you take another shot and you go, it's a bit better, still could be brighter and so on and so forth. This is just kind of, you know, wearing the shutter down a little bit and you're just taking a long time to work out the right exposure. Why bother? Just jump into live view and just work it out from there for the scene that you're facing. And obviously, it's not about getting the optimal exposure as well. You might want to protect the highlights at all matter, or you might want to be blowing them and you're going for a high key shot. It doesn't matter, but this is just a, a really simple way of quickly assessing what the camera's going to give you if you start shooting in this mode rather than chimping it all the time. I just find this is it's like a real time chimping. And I think that's a really good advantage to use that. Um, and it keeps you a little bit more in line with what some of those mirrorless advantages have so yeah i mean that that that's it really it's a really small little one but i think it's it's underutilized um if you want the, the histogram to be shown in the live view then i believe you come along to where is it live view and then histogram display make sure that that's checked and then you'll be able to see it there in the bottom left so yeah just basically use it nobody's you know it's just a, a little bit underrated just quickly use live view to get what you're looking at and then then toggle out and shoot through the OVF like you normally would but it's a nice way to just get things uh, get things going quickly all right okay um staying with live view um i promise it won't be a tutorial all about live view but i just wanted to point out a few things that i think uh, people uh, overlook because this camera has the OVF and we love it and we all want to shoot from the eye i get that but there are some nice little autofocus modes that i think some people don't understand or don't utilize and sometimes you actually need them um it's not that they they're just an alternative way to shoot sometimes they can be the only way to shoot sometimes you just can't get your head behind the, the eyepiece um because you're you're constrained or you're shooting from a low angle or something like that so a couple of couple of uh, shooting modes i just wanted to go through and make sure people understood because i i feel as though um, if you know your camera inside and out, you become a better photographer because you can adapt to the situation and circumstances you find yourself in. It's not always possible to use that OVF. If you're shooting on the floor up at an angle, how can you get your head down that low and staring through an eyepiece? I mean, and depending on what you're lying on, it just might, might not be something you can do. So first one is a bit of my default is uh, the, the, um, the tracking mode here. Um, so you press it if mode button and you can rotate through them all but um, I quite often leave it in default in tracking mode and this is kind of this is kind of Pentax's lame version of object tracking but it, it doesn't work too bad let me just chuck it this uh, can of coke here so how it works is you push and hold the half press the shutter speed um shutter speed half press the shutter and it locks on okay and then you can you know recompose your shot and then just you know let go and then reacquire again now, the reason I say let go and reacquire again is because in live view mode, we're not working with autofocus continuous at all. And I think people confuse this kind of tracking as to being AFC, and it's not really AFC or tracking. For example, if I get closer to this, it stays blurry. Do you see that? It's just still out of focus, even though it's trying to track. So that's why you should let go and then reacquire again before taking the shot. Okay, so it's, but it is actually a very useful mode. Sometimes I've done stuff where I've been, you know, staring up at the ceiling or something like that and, and needing to get focused that way. And there's no other mode other than this one. So it's, it's, a, it's a handy little mode. So it's quite hard to do this whilst 
doing a video at the same time and, and not looking at it on the back of the camera, but something else. But there are limits. Um, it does need contrast. It can get lost if you go too quickly as well. It's going to struggle to find it and reacquire like that. So you do have to be quite patient with it. It also stays where you left it as well. Um, I think you could reset it by pressing the OK. Yes, the OK button and menu will put it back in the middle. But it is, it's, a, it's a nice, helpful little little tool that you can just use to quickly take a shot. And it needs something of contrast. So if you try and pick the middle of the chair with nothing, it will struggle. And sometimes it will hunt for something close by with a bit of contrast. So just watch out for that as well. But that would be... That's one, one mode I think is actually really quite useful um, just to get those kind of quick quick grabs. For sure, I'm a, I'm a fan of um, focus, recompose and, and single point. You know, when I'm not in live view, that is typically what you see is my center point there. Um, or I actually, another super hint is I believe that spot there is actually a little bit more accurate for AF than actually a single AF point um, as a spot. So just, uh, so yeah, typically I'm actually usually shoot like that when I'm using OVF but um, for those situations that doesn't work this has actually been a bit of a lifesaver for me to be able to use this mode and it works pretty well but yeah you focus recompose and if you've really changed the you know your distance and you've come in close to the subject or something like that then let go and then push down again to reacquire and then take the shot all right the other mode that I think is seldom used is Face detection. Now, I can't demonstrate this right now because I've got no face here, but I'll show you um, a, a couple of samples up on the screen here of where I think face detection works really quite well. Um, the only word of warning with this one is people mistake it for being eye detection. It's not really eye detection. It is face detection. It works best when your subjects are just looking straight at you. If there are a little bit of a side like I am to you now, you may find it's focusing on the further away eye rather than the closer one. So it's a bit of a lottery as, as to what you get, but both eyes staying at the camera. It's fairly accurate and quite a nice quick way to get it. And even at very wide apertures, you'll 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 look and zoom in and you'll find it's the eyes more often than not that are actually in focus. It's not going to highlight the, the tip of the nose or the ears. It does tend to do quite a good job of, of getting the, the eyes in focus. So that's another one to use occasionally when um, when it calls for, but really that's it really. It just, uh, that's, a, that's a quick one. It's just AF track and there are some other modes here. Um, that I don't use quite as much multiple AF points you can use this one you can make it a bigger square a smaller square and you can move that around but I don't typically use this one very often um, you can use the other ones like moving a spot around but I don't really see the point in these ones I would just use the OVF for that but certainly this one's a bit useful and people are a bit confused as to how it works but that's that's how that one that one works and I think between these two portrait and face detection they're my most used autofocus for live view um, when I have to use that all right let's talk about user modes um, one of the things I think is um, is a good feature on the the Pentax camera is the five user modes okay so I have them number one portraiter Okay, so this is my portrait mode. Number two is drunk. It doesn't mean I use it when I'm drunk. It means it's it's a TV shift mode where I prioritize low shutter. It's like dragging the shutter. It's something I do at weddings and events and things like that. Landscape mode, um, for me, you could set this up differently to be in bracketing or whatever, but you can see there I set up for an AV shot with um, the remote control and we're looking at um, having pixel shift engaged. That's, that's usually my go-to. Um, and then wildlife. Wildlife differs quite a lot from my other shooting modes because it's in uh, focus release rather than focus priority, um, things like that. And it's, yeah, there's a lot of other things. And then lastly, I usually leave one as temporary. Temporary is maybe something I've been doing on the fly, or maybe I've taken something like this mode here, but changed the white balance or something like that. And I want to just store that, but I don't want to, I don't want to change the base um you know user mode so i just store this one similar to that one and i'll just just dump it up there but um look it is it is quite standard how many people don't use the the user modes i think with their pentax cameras that so you've you've paid your money and it's given you five user modes it's like, it was actually a defining point for me when i chose the the pentax kp as the backup camera to the, the k1 because it also had five user modes and i saw that as being 
really ad advantageous um, compared to some of the other cameras that only had three. Um, so I mean, for me, like if if I was going out on a on a bush bush walk or something with my better half, you know, I'm, my default I might walk around um, in wildlife mode. I might have a PLM lens attached, a so 55 to 300 or something, and I'm ready basically if I see, you know, as we're walking, you know, a lizard, a snake, a bird or something that I want to photograph, then I'm ready to go with that mode. And I've, I've given myself the best chance to quickly snap that moment without menu diving and, and pissing about trying to set things up, up for it. Then, you know, once we get to the waterfall or something like that, I'm, I've toggled across to landscape mode. I'm set up um, immediately to use the wireless remote. I've got the camera in the, the tripod. I've found my composition. I just have to hit, hit, hit the remote button and I've got the shot. It's all ready for pixel shifting as well. So then maybe later on, um, you know, I would well like to take a, a portrait shot of my wife, um, you know, on the rocks or something like that, you know, admiring a waterfall. And that mode is all geared up to, to give me a high success chance of, of doing that. So you know, there's a lot more details than what this is showing you right now. There's a lot more things going under the hood that I've tinkered, such as focus priority versus release priority and AFS versus AFC and, and even just AF modes that I've set up, you know, for live view. This one, for example, might have, um, you know, face detection because it's a portrait mode. Face detection is, is biased towards that. Other modes might, you know, the landscape mode, for example, might be biased towards select where I can move the the AF point around and select a rock or a tree or something like that. You, you get the point. So there's a few more things happening there, but really, I mean, I, I get the people that love just using manual and that's all they use their cameras for. There's nothing wrong with that at all, but you just, you have paid for these features and time can be of the essence when you're trying to catch things and document things. So the quicker you are, the more you understand your camera and, and can pull something from it. I just think that helps you out photographically with, with your content and what you are able to create. So definitely, start working out how to use them if you're not sure how to use them it's pretty simple whatever configuration you come up with in your camera at the time you just press menu you come along to number five and you go to save user mode and you just save those settings and you pick a slot which whichever one you want to save okay once you hit that you save and that's it you can then rename it to anything you like you go down here and then you can choose what to rename it but yeah really again it's another one I've, i scratch my head at that people don't tend to use this enough um you know, you can have, yeah, plethora of different ways. Um, I mean, sometimes I might even have, if I know I'm going to go out and do landscape, I might even set up a couple of, of landscape, one and one's, one's bracketing and one's pixel shift, just to save me pissing about in camera, turning things on and off. But um, the same thing can be for wildlife. I might even have one that's wildlife for slow and wildlife for fast. And the difference might be that one is a crop and jpegs versus one that's raw and full you know full frame all these sorts of things so yeah we're going to finish on um the the most underrated feature i think of all okay and this one we'll have to delve into a little bit of software as well to help you out because i think a lot of people get put off by this mode they either think it's not doing anything or they're not sure how to approach it so i really want to just help school people on that and how i approach this um topic We'll do that next. Okay, finally, we're gonna deal with pixel shift. Um, for some reason, this is another one of those features that I, I know of a few Pentaxians that have not really used yet. Um, a lot of people not too sure how to use it, what are the benefits from using it. So this is why I, I think, honestly, this is one of the biggest reasons why I'm still holding on to the, the, the Pentax K1 and choosing to take that out for, on a lot of walks, things like landscape work where uh, image quality is really um, important to me versus capturing moments where, um, you know, something like the Fuji is, is very good for that. It's not all about image quality, but the moment captured, that's what that camera can help me for. But if it's just something a little bit more slow and deliberate, um, I've got a tripod with me. Pixel shift is a fantastic feature. So. First off, I think a lot of people feel as though um, pixel shift has this advantage of, of having higher image quality. And it kind of does, yes, but it's not really the entire point of, of that mode. What it will do is give you a lot more pliability in post-processing when you are pushing and pulling highlights and shadows and things like that. It's a little bit like, and I'm not exaggerating here, it's a little bit like having a medium format um, feature set in a full frame camera where we all know that when you go to medium format you get much greater dynamic range it's a little bit like that it's not 
okay, it's not on the same level, but it's not too far away from it. And it certainly does um, beef up that, the, the camera's capabilities um, when you use this mode. So you're gonna get things like, um, when you start messing around with sharpness sliders and texture and clarity, it's gonna hold up better. It's not going to fall apart as quickly. You're gonna find you can push the threshold for those sliders further than you can with a non-pixel shifted file and things not you know, completely collapse in terms of quality. You're gonna be able to raise and lift shadows and things like that without the, the noise coming in nearly as severely. Um, you're gonna have some better color accuracy as well. The color one's an interesting one because sometimes it looks like you can take a non-pixel shifted file and a pixel shifted file and mess around with the, the, the equally with the sliders and colors and not really see any difference. And other times it's, it's, it's night and day. You wonder why those browns are so much better on the pixel shifted file and that, and that they fell apart on the non-pixel shifted file and so on and so forth. So I don't really understand why it works sometimes. It might just be color dependent or something like that. I'm not, too, I'm not entirely sure, but I have seen it with my own eyes. I've seen colors just hold together far stronger and better with pixel shifted files so it's a kind of I think it must be to do with the lighting and the color um, but it's a case-by-case -case scenario but for sure it's a good it's a good mode now in terms of using the mode this is what I say um, when you are tripoding up for a landscape shot it doesn't matter if there's a, a you know some movement like water we can fix that problem that's not a problem but what I do encourage you is to always take a second non-pixel shifted shot along with a pixel shifted shot that's very important if you just use pixel shift on its own without a second frame that's the same settings taken you know just a second later you you will struggle to fix some of the problems in post there are other other applications that can help but I would recommend at least walk away with a safe non-pixel shifted shot as well. Now there are ways to deal with motion. Uh, some people use third-party programs like Raw Therapy, um, Silky Picks and other things like that. I try and keep everything under Adobe Lightroom and just work on the problems um, with Photoshop and Adobe um, systems. That's how I prefer to go about it. So. We're going to get in now to an example of where maybe pixel shift is. I'm going to show you some of those strengths versus weaknesses and also how to deal with that kind of motion and just take the stress out of using this mode so that people will feel as though once you've watched this segment that I understand now why it's useful and I'm not going to be afraid to use it because a lot of Pentax K1 users, they are going out there with a tripod. If you're going to tripod up for the shot, it's just mind boggling why you wouldn't use this feature. So the first thing is make sure you do bind it into your shortcuts um, in the info section and then you can you know, make sure that you can toggle it on and off quite quickly from that portal. I think that's quite an important aspect of, of it. You, you don't want to menu dive too much, otherwise you're making it difficult for yourself. So like I say, you can set up the user mode in the camera to just be in pixel shift, and then, um, or you can set it up as a shortcut in the info. Let's have a look at um, a file. Now, um, this file here, I'll just start recording. Um, this file here in Lightroom, um, I've shown this one before. This is a, a file we used um, in a previous video when I was comparing medium format to full frame. Uh, but for the illustrative, uh, Ill illustrative purposes, um, this works quite well. So um, what I do is I pull both files in. What we have here, this, um, let's just put them next to each other. This is a reference file that I, and this one. So we have um, two files here. The one on the left is, they're both the same um, parameters. You can see they're both taken um, with a minus one EV bias, one 250, F8, ISO 200, and one is pixel shifted and one is not. Which is which is quite easy to find. If you if you find some water or something with movement, you'll be able to see that one has got this one weird artifacts that are coming in from the motion and one doesn't. Okay, so you can work out quite quickly which file has a problem, which one doesn't. But in terms of post processing, I would um, highlight both files and then have auto sync on. And then I just do my edit and as, as per normal with the pixel shifted file, that's what I'm trying to get at. It can, can't be more simpler than that. You, you can choose, you know, what kind of rendering you want to go for. If you want to make it mono or anything like that, you can choose all those things, play around with the sliders and you're just highlighting and making sure that every change you make on the pixel shifted file is also echoed onto the non-pixel shifted file. because we're gonna use that file later on to correct the motion. But for the moment, let's just, I just wanna highlight some of those strengths of, of the pixel shift. So right now, there's things to fix. To, if you can ignore this little green um, tint up here, what that is, that's the light 
reflecting off the water, sparkling, and then obviously because it's pixel shifted, that's something we need to deal with in post processing. But if we can have a look at this this shadow here, um, let's just really raise these shadows now, and let's maximum, and then let's bring up the exposure. Now I've gone a heck of a way now, and I still have fairly clean shadow lift at that level. Okay. Now if we ch check the non-pixel shifted file actually we'll just reference this so i adjusted both of them the same you can see hopefully you'll be able to see that you know the pixel shifted one is far cleaner um hang on there we go the pixel shifted file is far cleaner at the same exposure lift as the non-pixel shifted this one's starting to fall apart quite quickly not only that we can actually see some some hot spots and some other kind of issues whereas this is actually kind of cleaner um we can we continue going and um lift that exposure a little bit more and then go back to reference and what a difference so we can see here iso 200 lifting the shadows to maximum lifting the exposure the non-pixel shifted file is really starting to suffer whereas the pixel shifted one is, is doing quite quite well and in fact i took this at iso 200 it would be even better if i took it at iso 100. so that just just to illustrate the power of the shadow recovery of pixel shift i thought that was worth mentioning um let me go back um you'll, you'll find as well um when it comes to things like an increased um an increase in the uh, sharpness and sliders when you start messing around with these sliders for, for, for texture and sharpness with the pixel shifted one you'll be able to go way higher before things start falling apart compared to the non-pixel shifted file as well so just bear that in mind as well um what we're going to do now though is is work on fixing this motion problem um got a big dust spot down there as well that i need to deal with so let's take both of these files into photoshop and we'll deal with that next uh, what i do is edit in open as layers in Photoshop. Okay, I'll skip to that now. So what you end up with is two files in Photoshop and one's above the other, okay? It doesn't really matter which one you, which one you have on top. I tend to prefer to have the pixel shifted one on top and the other one underneath. It just lets me know, you know, what I have to deal with um, in post-processing post if I want to fix, fix the you know the, the problems so over here we've got the water to fix and it couldn't be easier all you do is just push this button down here create a mask that's going to create a white mask and as soon as we start brushing with black ink i use a, a fairly soft brush okay once we start brushing in it's just we make sure the the flow is 100 because we're wanting it to completely cover it it's just going to eradicate all of the imperfections that are there you could do this with a uh, a brush if you prefer i'm just doing it very quickly with a mouse instead of getting the brush out simple and that's you basically corrected it you can just have a look at your mask by pressing alt and left clicking you'll see places you've missed so you can do that just to kind of step it up and press alt click again and then when it comes to the sort of the, the area of this this rock here where things aren't working again you can just sort of get a get a small one and just go over it simple as that Okay, so I just leave all the motion correction to be dealt with at the very end, you know, and you can just manually go over it. Easy, easy peasy. Yeah, I'm obviously rushing this very quickly. I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes. A bit, a bit. That is how I deal with, with, with pixel shift. Now, depending on what you're shooting and the, and the scene that you're facing, you might not even have that much to do waterfalls are obviously a little bit more trickier because you've got to blend the uh, you know the water in just like like here but maybe a bit be a bit more careful sometimes you'll might you'll might notice there's problems in trees so there we go over here we can see this one's a bit buggy so you can come in here and sort of fix that tree up it depends so you'll you'll have to you know and you have to decide how far you go with it and whether it's worth it. If you find that there's, God, there's a lot of stuff we've got to fix here, then you can actually do the reverse. So I'll just show you, I'll just delete this layer mask here. You could instead work with the non-pixel shifted file on top and instead decide to paint in the pixel shifted on the places that you know there can't be any motion problems such as the rock faces so now we'll do the same thing again 
we've put the mask on and we get a brush and we just start painting over here. Now it doesn't look like much is happening because I'm zoomed out. But once you get on your own computer and you start doing this, you'll start to notice the pixel shifted is, is taking effect. And if you start doing it in the area that's got problems like over here, you've went whoops a daisy, I've started bringing those, those green things back, then you just have to change the paint to white and undo that. All right, but basically, yeah, it's it, it's up. You you're then deciding how much of your image you want to be in, um, you know, pixel shifted. So in a, in, a, in an image like this, you might go, well, I don't know if pixel shift was was worth it. Like, how much of my scenery is really transfixed and not going to have some motion in it? Because it, even though this was taken quite quickly at one two fiftieth of a second, pixel shift is still going to take a second to finish, okay? Because the Pentax K1 is only four frames a second. So it can't go any faster than that. So you do have, it doesn't matter if it's one two thousandths of a second, you've always got to think about your scene in terms of being one second long, you know, at, at the very quickest. Um, and you just kind of assess whether, you know, it's worth it. Obviously for things like still life, if you're doing, you know, shooting bowls of fruit or whatever you're doing, then you don't really have any motion to correct at all. As long as the light stays pretty consistent in that, you know, natural daylight or whatever that's that's hitting that um, bowl of fruit, as long as it stays consistent for that one second or two, even two or three seconds, you won't have any really artifacts to deal with mopping up anyway. But that's how I that's how I approach it. Once you've once you've got your final product, you then just flatten the image, and then you can hit file and save, and then export it from Lightroom or just you know export it from here directly. So I hope that helps. Anyway, um, it is a it is a you do use the feature, do explore it. Don't like the fact that you you use it near waterfall. It can be wonderful to have um, you know a merge of pixel shifted rock that's moss textured and really insanely detailed and rich with colors and then the, and then correct the, the the waterfall motion it's it's not as hard as you think but just by doing what i've just done there you don't need to go to other external programs like silky pix or raw therapy where you're going to end up with a tiff file instead of raw just you know just follow my previous steps there and i think you'll find it's, it can be a feature well worth it the only thing really it comes down to it is the hassle. You have to weigh up when you're facing that scene and whether it's worth pixel shifting or not. But I almost look at it these days as just an alternative to bracketing, you know. I prefer almost working this way and just lifting the shadows like like I've just shown you because they're, they're cleaner and I'm not having to work with a merge and all that kind of stuff as well. Bracketing has problems too. So things can move in those five, those, um, when you've taken those five frames or three frames, there can exist some motion problems there as well. So there's always a motion um, problem, really. You can't get away from it, but this is this is how I approach it. Now, I'll sign off now. So I, I think that's it. I, I've really kind of said all I can really about the Pentax. Um, probably the last thing I, I would I would say is just that the lenses are absolutely gorgeous. Um, some of these lenses like the, you know, the FA31, um, there's some beautiful other reasons to shoot Pentax, I've just given you a few, a handful of, of why it's, it's kicking around, and I've not, I've not punted it yet, and just went all aboard with Fuji. I've just treat these cameras as tools, and this one's well suited to certain applications, and this one's well, well suited to other. For, for sure, the video of Fuji's great for video. I'm very grateful for it. But um, yeah, I, I'll leave it there. And um, if this, if this helped, leave a, a like and a subscribe. And if you want to ask a question, do so in the comments below. Thank you very much.